believe you love. Amen. And rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, the Bible says. Amen. We don't know him after the flesh anymore. It wouldn't do any good to know him after the flesh. He's glorified now at the right hand of the Father. He sure is. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis 5 with me tonight. Genesis 5. I encourage you to go through and read the book of Genesis again. Read it about at least once a year. The book of Genesis is the foundation for the whole Bible. Genesis chapter number 5 and verse number 21. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Father, bless this book now. Amen. We approach the Bible with reverence because we believe it's God's Word, don't we? We certainly do, folks. That doesn't mean there aren't a lot of other good books in the world. There certainly are, but they're not the Word of God. That's the difference. This book is infallible. You notice something that you're reading here is right before the flood. And it's uh, the line of uh, Seth. Of course, we know what happened to Abel, to hands of Cain. But the line of Seth is the prophetic line. In Genesis 3.15, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the, and thou, and the, and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And uh, that enmity rages even to this very day. The Lord Jesus Christ was the seed of Abraham, according to the book of Galatians. Yeah. In Genesis chapter number 5, therefore, the chronology, the genealogy that flows from Seth is very important, very important. Before the flood, there was an in intermixture or a, an adulteration of the humankind by angels, I believe. A lot of people don't believe that, but I do. I believe that based upon what it says in Genesis 6 and the Hebrew Nephilim, and I also believe it according to what Peter talks about, the angels that kept not their first estate. And, uh, and of, in, uh, so we know that something happened profound before the, before, uh, before the flood that brought on the flood. And what that was, of course, was the adulteration or the mixture of the human flesh or the human seed. And this was an attempt by Satan to, to destroy the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. Now, women do not have seed, obviously, we know that. But, of course, the seed of the woman would be seed found in the woman that was placed there by the hand of Almighty God, which, of course, uh, uh, there again gives you an idea of the virgin birth because it had nothing to do with a man. But in Genesis chapter number 5, Enoch is a remarkable person because his name means teaching or initiation. So God's going to show us something. And you'll notice his son's name is Methuselah. Now he named him because of prophecy. You all know that. You've heard that many times. How many know what that name means? There's about three or four different variations on it, but they all mean about the same thing. When he is dead, it will be sent. Or when he dies, it will come. Something of that nature. It what? What's it? It is a reference to the flood. Jude talked about him, and he said, The prophet Enoch prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to ex ex exercise judgment or execute judgment. So before the flood, prophecy was beginning to develop in the line of Seth, and they were beginning to understand this. Not only are we going to have a, a Messiah from Genesis 3.15, but God's going to preserve that line. And it's very important to understand something. Notice the comparison here. It says in the book of Jude that, that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. All right, that's divine perfection. You can't get any better than that. What happens? Then you go to eight, which the number means new beginning. The gematria of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is eight, eight, eight. New beginning, new beginning, new beginning. So the seventh from Adam means that God has brought to consummation his prophecy in revealing what's about to happen to the earth. And Methuselah means when he is dead it will be sent. This man walked with God and was not for God took him, the Bible says. He did not die. He was translated, the scripture says, that he should not see death. But now notice his namesake in the line of Cain. Go back over here to the book of Genesis chapter number 4 and verse 17 and there's another Enoch in, uh, in the book of Genesis. 
leading up to the flood. Genesis chapter number 4 and verse number uh, 17. Notice the word, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, same name, teaching, initiation. And he did what? He built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So here is the first city builder. All right? Specifically so named in Scripture, he builds a city. Now compare the city builder with the one who's called out of the world. And you'll get an idea right off the bat of how God sees things. Cain's posterity was putting their roots down, settling deep in planet earth. The prophetic line was looking for the coming of the promise and one to come and get them. See the difference? Big difference. Cain was a city builder. Now the, for the most part the Bible doesn't have much good to say about cities. The real, really the only good city mentioned in the Bible is the New Jerusalem which is said in the book of Galatians to be above which is free in the mother of us all. That's a good city. That New Jerusalem is a living organism that, was, uh, that is built by the hand of God. It says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, they looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. They who? The patriarchs, the pilgrims and strangers on this earth, like us. We have no continuing city on this earth. We don't put roots down here because God's not going to pull you up by the roots. He's going to come and take you away when He comes to get us. But city, cities, for the most part in the Bible, have a bad reputation. Here's what Thomas Jefferson said about cities. I view great cities as pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of man. He said again, the mobs of great cities add just so much to support of pure government as sores do to the strength of the human body. Quote again, when they get plied upon one another in large cities as in Europe, they will become corrupt as in Europe. Has America been corrupted? Where's the corruption? It's in the cities. If you looked at a demographic of the last election that put President in the United States of America and looked at the voting, you'll find that it was the cities that put the present occupant at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Make no mistake about it. It was the cities. As far as the land mass is concerned of the United States, the voting of the land mass, the spreading out of the populace, overwhelmingly voted for the Republican. But on the other hand, the cities are the one who put the Democrat in office. Is America going up or down? Is it getting better or is it getting worse? Cities, therefore, in the Scripture don't hold a very good light to what God wants us to have. Hebrews chapter number 10, 12, verse 22 says, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. When I said in Jerusalem, which is above is free, the mother of us all, that Jerusalem, this new Jerusalem, is the bride of Christ. Why does Christ need a bride? Because spiritual seed is begotten from that union between Christ and His bride. If you can understand that in a spiritual sense, you can understand where you came from. You came from that second man, the last Adam. Your birth, your new birth, is of the Lord Jesus Christ and only of Him. He doesn't need anything else. The bride of Christ is the virgin daughter of Zion. She is even to this very moment being made. She's not finished. And when she is finished and you go to that gate, you'll find it of pure, a pearl. And a pearl is something that is formed from great exertion, from suffering, from the pearl, the, the, the oyster itself building a layer upon layer upon layer to protect it from the grinding and the irritation of the stone that it receives. So what is it? It's the, ex it's the essence of its life. It literally pours out its own life to give it what it is. The church of God is the life of Christ. Amen. If the Lord Jesus Christ is not everything to us, of us, from us, about us, we're nothing. We're not about organization. We're not about movements. We're not about human ability. There's plenty of that in the church today. We're not about great men and great movements. We're about a great God. If the church ever really focused its mind on what we're about, really set its affection on things above, loved Christ with all of its heart the way it should, you'd be amazed at how many demons that you'd fetter out in process. You would. You'd clear out a lot of evil spirits by simply doing that, just focusing upon Christ. So the Bible tells us that Enoch, before the flood, looked to him that was invisible, believed in him that was invisible, 
walked with him that was invisible. We have no indication in the Bible at all where Enoch ever saw God, but he believed what he heard. What did he hear? He heard what Adam told him. He heard what Adam told Seth. He heard what Adam told Seth and Seth told him on down to who he was. He believed the word of God. All of these, all of these uh, uh, antediluvian, we call them, that's a big word, simply means before the flood. All of these people who lived before the flood lived without a written Bible. No Bible was written. Always keep in mind that the Bible itself, as we understand it, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, were written by Moses about 1,400 years before Christ. Now, whenever the book of Job was written, as I've said to you many times ago, nobody has a clue. If it was written contemporary to Job, it was written about 1900 B.C. And if that be the case, then we're looking at, uh, we're looking at almost 4,000 years from the writing of the Bible. But Adam was created 6,000 years ago. Look at all the time that passed with no Bible. Think about it. So how did it pass? It passed from the spoken Word of God. Amen. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. His Word is forever settled in heaven. It will never diminish. It's eternal because it's the Word of God. It's the Son of God. And it cannot be changed. And so Enoch gives us an idea of what God expects of us. He wants us to believe Him. He wants us to look with spiritual eyes. He wants us to anticipate His coming. He wants us to separate ourselves from this world. He wants us to understand clearly that God makes a distinction between the two lines, one of Seth, one of Cain. Cain is of that wicked one. And you can make your choice, either Cain or Seth. You can't say Adam because Cain's the son of Adam. And the Bible tells you plainly in the book of Romans chapter 5, that first Adam, the only thing you ever got from him was death. You inherited death from that first Adam. But the last Adam is the Lord from heaven. Amen. Now I want you to look at another one here. And this one is, uh, is, uh, is Noah. In the book of Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 9. Now these are the generations of Noah. <clears throat> Notice carefully. <clears throat> the generations of Noah. Notice that God calls your attention to the generations. It's important to understand that generations are important with God. It is the, it is the prom promogenitor. Look at chapter number 5 and verse 1. The book of the generations of Adam. See that? The generations of Adam. He's giving you a clear line of how you can trace the genealogy back. This is why you find it in Matthew and you find it in Luke. The writers of the New Testament, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only two of them give you a genealogy. Matthew gives you a genealogy and Luke gives you a genealogy. Their genealogy is taken from the Word of God. And that word is you have before you right now, the generations of Adam. And then God, he narrows it down, okay? He brings the generation down to a specific person and his people. Because all of Adam's people are not right. Like I say, Cain is from Adam. So you can't simply say, well, I'm a, I'm a son of Adam. Well, you may be a son of Adam, but you may be a son of the devil too. <laughs> You see, when someone says, well, God's the father of all mankind. He's the father of mankind in the sense he's the creator. But if you don't know him spiritually, he's not your father. John 8, 44 makes it plain. You're of your father, the devil. How does he become your father, preacher? By the new birth. That's the only way he can be your father. And it must be by the new birth. But if you'll notice in Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 9, the generations of Noah, his name means rest. Noah was a just man. <coughs> and perfect in his generations and walked with God. If you'll notice back here that Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God and so did Noah walk with God. This walking with God is a thing that shows up in the Old Testament and it's the kind of thing that, uh, that you have to take a look at and you say to yourself, I wonder why it was important for God to say they walked with God. But they did walk with God. And the reason they walked with God is because they had fellowship with him. Genesis chapter number 5 and verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Look at Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 1. Abram was 90 years old and nine, 99. The Lord, Jehovah, capital L-O-R-D, appeared to Abram, before he named him Abraham, he does in this chapter. He appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. You see that? That's very interesting. I'll look at that with you in just a moment. 
Walk before me and be perfect. And somebody said, well, how in the world can a man be perfect? We'll talk about that in a minute of what shows up in that text. But back here in the book of, uh, back here in the book of Genesis chapter number 6, Noah was perfect in his generations. The Hebrew word translated perfect here is tamim. All you have to do is get a lexicon, look it up, and you'll find out that word means pure in his genealogy, pure in his pedigree. What's happening? God's maintaining the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. You ask yourself the question, why doesn't God just do what he wants to do? I mean, can't he just intervene? Yes, he can. But for a reason that we just barely understand, Satan has a legal right to a lot of things on this earth. And God will not circumvent that. He will destroy Satan with Satan's own power and devices. He'll do it. This is why he allows him access and he allows him certain privileges. And right now, Satan's the God of this world. And so when God does these things, he allows Satan to play his hand and do the best job he can at it. And then God will defeat him every time. So here he has the generations of Noah. Tamim is the Hebrew word. Keep that word in mind. Tamim. That means pure in his pedigree. Now I'm not up here this, tonight preaching to you racial preferences. I'm not up here tonight trying to, to differentiate between a black man, a white man, a red man, and a yellow man. The Bible said in the book of Acts plainly, made of the one blood all men. We tasted death for every man. Christ died for a, a red man, a yellow man, a black man, a white man. I don't believe the theory that some of these guys out here preaching that where some certain people are cursed from birth and their race and all, I don't buy that. I believe Christ is the Savior of all men. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, would have all men to be saved. But that does not discount the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was born in the tribe of Judah. He was the line of the tribe of Judah. Judah. Judah was a Jew. He was not born uh, an Englishman. He was not born an Italian or a Frenchman. He was not born of Japheth. He was not born of Ham. He was born of Shem. And God has that privilege to choose the way he brings his son into the world. And so we have Noah perfect in his generations. The word is tamim. That means that his pedigree was pure. Here's an interesting thing in Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 14 about Noah. It says in Ezekiel 14, 14, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. In plainer words, Noah, Daniel, and Job are connected with righteousness in the Old Testament. Now that's a remarkable thing. Think about it. He put a David in there. He could have put Solomon in there. He could have put Samuel in there, but he didn't. He put Noah, Job, and Daniel, connecting them with righteousness. Old Testament righteousness is not the same as New Testament righteousness. See, so what do you mean? New Testament righteousness is a person. Old Testament righteousness was something that was wrought in obedience. Now, if there's a difference between Old Testament righteousness, which is wrought in obedience, and New Testament righteousness, which is a person, who do you suppose that person would be? <laughs> Have any ideas? Who's the righteous one? Pardon? He can walk on water, can't he? Yeah. He's the righteous one. That's what the Bible calls him. The righteous one. And the righteousness of this righteous one is the righteousness now that gains entrance to heaven. Amen. And no other way but by the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall descend into the mountain of the Lord? A question is asked, who can do it? Who can come into my presence? See, who can do it? God asks a question. He knows the answer, but he wants you to find it. So Noah walked with God just like Enoch did. Noah was preserved just like Enoch. Enoch was carried out of this world. Noah was carried from this world to another world. He crossed the flood. He crossed the water. And he went from one to the other. Now Abraham in Genesis chapter number 17 and verse 1, the Bible says he was 90 years old and nine. All right. The writer of the book of Romans, the apostle Paul said, as good as dead. <laughs> That's what he said. He said he was as good as dead. As good as dead. <laughs> now we know how long Abraham, how long did Abraham live? Anybody have any idea? That's right. 175 years. One of the longest living people after the antediluvians. 
The longest living man that's recorded in the scripture, who is that? Methuselah. The one who was named by his father, Enoch, Methuselah. And how long did he live? 969. Adam almost lived that long, 930 something. 969 years. Somebody said, well, now preacher, there's no way these people live that long. Good night. I mean, you know, I mean, after all, how much do you expect us to believe? You know, I mean, we know better than that today. Do you really? Do you really? Do you understand the situation as it was before the flood? A canopy covered the earth. It didn't rain. They'd never seen any rain. They did not eat meat before the flood. The bodies that had been made when God made Adam, he made, him, made a body that was, I guess, in every, all essentials perfect. He made his body to live. Sin entered, and when sin came in, death by sin. Two deaths took place the moment Adam sinned. Death of his spirit, and his body started dying. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But in any event, the Bible tells us here that Abraham was 90 years old and nine. It's the way God does things that we need to latch on to. He never does it according to human reasoning. He, he doesn't work according to what appears to be, you know, well, this, is, this, is, this would be beneficial. This is an opportunity. This is this. This is that. It doesn't make a difference with God. He said, I open, no man shuts. I shut, no man opens. He said, I set before you an open door. He waited until all human ability had passed, good as dead, 90 years old and nine. And the son that would be born is Yitzhak, Isaac. The name means laughter. That's right. His brother was 13 years old when he was born. His brother was born at the hand of Hagar. Now I want you to think about it a minute. Abraham had one wife. Her name was Sarah. He also had a hand, she had a handmaid whose name was Hagar the Egyptian. He bore a child by her, Ishmael. After Sarah died, he, bore, he married again, Keturah. Bore a child by her, bore, the more, bore the, more than one child. Yeah, by Keturah. And uh, in plainer words, Abraham had children scattered around, but he only had one begotten son. That's good. Oh, yeah. Just one begotten son. His only begotten son. That's the way God sees it. That's a way to understand the Bible. One of the best ways to understand Scripture is not to try to approach it with your intellect and figure it out. And there's certainly nothing wrong with studying the Bible and using your intellect that God gave you but revelation is how God teaches us how He reveals Himself and His will. In this case, He said, He's my only begotten Son. Now, Abraham was 90 years old and nine. You know the story. You've heard it a thousand times. You've read it many times. He comes to them. He comes to Abram, and He says to him, you're going to have a son. And Abram responds to him in the 17th chapter and says, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. I, want my, I love my son Ishmael. Well, I don't blame Abraham for loving his son. I don't blame him at all for loving his son, but that was not the son of promise. You see, from Genesis chapter number 3, verse 15, all the way to the birth of Christ, there's a seed that is attached with promise. And it has nothing to do with human ability. It has to do with God fulfilling a promise. God fulfills a promise when people react in faith. When you act in faith, God, if you act in faith, God can bless you where you can receive the promise of God. He said to them in the book of Acts, he said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the what? Promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. Well, what happened in Acts chapter number 2 on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Ghost came down, right? Well, it's obvious that that was part of the promise of the Father, that He would send them the Spirit. But they had to wait, they had to pray, and they had to seek the face of God, and God in His way and time sent the promise. All right. So what brought the promise and how did he come? He came by faith. But how can faith come? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. What happens in Genesis 17? God plants the seed of faith into Abram and Sarah. And both of them reacted the way most of us do. They laughed in scorn, <laughs> rebelled, didn't accept it right off the bat. But that doesn't stop God. Because God is able to overrule a human ignorance and rebellion. Amen. And He's overruled your ignorance and rebellion, and He's overruled my ignorance and rebellion many times. Have I ever rebelled against God? Amen. Have you ever rebelled against God? Everybody raise your hand. We all have. We don't have any super saints. I'll warn you now, when you start getting around super saints, watch them. <laughs> You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Every one of us wrestle with the flesh. 
Romans chapter number 7 spells it out real good. But now watch this thing carefully. This is very interesting. In Genesis 17, he says to Abraham, he said, Walk before me and be thou perfect. All right. Now on the surface of it, you're reading English, okay? There's nothing wrong with English. It's, it's, in fact, I'm glad I speak English. I'd be being hard pressed to try to speak anything else. But the word perfect, as it's used in the Bible, doesn't always mean what we think perfect means. In the English language, when we use the word perfect, we think, well, this, this person has achieved perfection, you know. I mean, there's no, there's no he, he's, he's perfect, you know. Has no problems, he has no blemishes, he or she. And that's the way we see the word. But the problem is, that's not always the meaning of it in the Bible. Here's the word translated perfect. You remember that little word tamim that I gave you a few minutes ago? When Noah was perfect in his generations? Same word. That's interesting. Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. I'm Almighty God. I'm the one who's able to, I'm, I'm the one who calls those things that be not as though they were. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Amen. Can you believe what he says when he says, I call those things that be not yeah. as though they were. Amen. It is his word. Believest thou this? Amen. Believest thou this? The question he asked. So he said to Abraham, I want you to walk in perfection. Yeah. You can take that to mean a lot of different things, but I'll tell you right now, it sure leans to me towards saying, I want your generation and your genealogy to remain exactly as it was with Noah because through you is coming the promise. Because I'm about to give you that promise. I'm giving you that promise right now. You're going to bear a son. Yeah. And Sarah was past childbearing and all of the everything. In other words, no natural ability. Well, God doesn't need natural ability. This is why the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, foolishness to him, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. The natural man is not an immoral man. The natural man is not a wicked man. The natural man's not a mean man. The natural man would probably be your best neighbor, may even take the coat off his back and give it to you, put you up if you have no place to stay, but his world is completely limited to what he can understand with his senses. That's the natural man. And everybody raise your hand tonight and say, yes, I'm guilty of being a natural man. I'm guilty of trying to serve God and walk in the flesh and be a natural man. See the difference? A carnal man, on the other hand, is an entirely different situation. Carnal is a fleshly man. He lives by his senses like the, like the natural man, but he wants to please his senses. That's his life. Hedonism grew out of that. What's hedonism? Well, go into any college uh, campus and you'll find all kind of hedonism. Go down on, 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 uh, on the, on the, uh, on the, the road after a ball game, go down Cumberland Avenue over here, and you'll find the bars uh, uh, full of hedonists, people that live for nothing but pleasure. That's a hedonist. That's the carnal man. That's the fleshly man. That's all he knows. There's a difference between the flesh and the natural. Natural is flesh, but natural rises to a higher level. He's a thinker. A natural man is a thinker. He's a philosopher. He's Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and all the rest of them. He has his idea about life and creation, all of that. For a deist, for example, Benjamin Franklin was a natural man. Who's Benjamin Franklin? Well, we all... I hope that they're still teaching folks about Benjamin Franklin. But, you know, everybody's seen the picture of Franklin flying a kite, and he's the man who discovered electricity and all that. Benjamin Franklin believed that there was a God, a creator. He believed that he put the universe into movement. He believed in the, he believed in the, the overruling, overriding providence of God, used great swelling words about God and all that. But the cross of Christ meant absolutely nothing to Benjamin Franklin. The difference between a deist and a theist, an atheist, atheist, a deist and an atheist, or an atheist, an atheist does not believe in God. A theist, he negates the theist, no God. The atheist says, no God. There's no God. No God. The Bible says, the Bible's got his name in a number of places, said the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He's a fool. The deist says, yes, there is a God. 
but you don't really know him personally. Yeah, that's right. You see, you can't know him personally. Right. He's a natural man. He lives by his senses, yeah. but we can know him personally. Yeah. How do you know him personally? Yeah. Seeing him who is invisible, Amen. believing in him, knowing him. You know him through his son, Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. How do you know him? You know him by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ absolutely must have the Holy Spirit to become real in your life and for you to understand who He is. The work of the Holy Spirit is to make Christ real to you in your heart. So, be thou perfect. Be thou perfect, Abraham. And so he was. But I want you to notice a remarkable thing here. It's kind of strange. I'll ask you a question when I give this to you tonight. And I'll let you take it away and do some thinking about it. Look at Genesis 25 and verse 1. I want to make you think now. And go home and think about this one. Genesis 25 and verse number 1. Then again Abram, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. She bare him Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Notice Midian. See Midian here in verse 2? All right. You remember Moses' father-in-law? His name was Jethro. You remember? You remember where Moses spent 40 years? After the first 40 of his life, he spent 40 years somewhere. Where was it? In Midian. And that's where he met Jethro. And what does the Bible say Jethro was? A priest. Exactly. He was the priest of Midian. He's kind of like Melchizedek in the Old Testament. Here's somebody that has a religious relationship and understanding. And Melchizedek is sanctioned in the Bible plainly in the book of Psalms and the book of Hebrews as a man of God because he was greater than Abraham. No question. Priest of the Most High after the order of Melchizedek. No question that he had the sense of the true God. He was at Jerusalem. But now Jethro, who was the priest of Midian, is also a descendant of Abraham. Notice, it tells you plainly, his mother was Keturah. Not, uh, not Sarah, but Keturah. So we got Abraham having children everywhere. But only one son of the promise. Only one son in the book of Romans chapter number 9 that was given the oracles of God. God had a line of truth, folks. And that line of truth was through the Jew. That doesn't mean that others didn't have elements of the truth. They certainly did. But you don't go to them for the truth. You go to the book, the Bible, to the Jew committed the oracles of God, to the scripture. That's the line of truth. Okay? But now, here's a remarkable thing. Here in Genesis 25, it goes on down and it says, verse 4, And the sons of Midian, Ephah, and Ephah, and Hanak, and Abedah, and Eldaah, all these were the children of Keturah. Now watch this. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. You see this? He gave everything he had to Isaac. Now keep reading. But the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts, now watch this, and sent them away from Isaac, his son. See that? Whilst he yet lived eastward into the east country. He made a clear distinction now between Isaac and all the rest of them. Oh, I'll be good to you. I'll give you a gift, but you're not my only begotten son. It's clear now. It's clear now to Abraham. It wasn't clear to him in Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, he said, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. See? See how his faith progresses? He wanted Ishmael to live before him. Ishmael. That was his son. That's his biological son. But it was through the works of the flesh, not faith. And therefore, it could not be of the promise. You can never make the works of the flesh of the promise. How hard you try, you cannot do it. It will never cross over. There is an, there's, there's a gulf between the two. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another. You cannot. The Bible said he that is in the flesh cannot please God. You never have power in the flesh to accomplish the promise. 
So your fleshly mind, your fleshly abilities, all of that will never get the job done. It comes by receiving what God said. Abraham finally did. Amen. In Genesis 17, oh, that Ishmael might live. But here in Genesis 25, he sent them away. He sent them all away and gave gifts to them and to his son. Now, here's another thing over here. I want you to look at this. And uh, this is Abraham getting a bride for Isaac. Look at Genesis chapter 24 and verse 1. Have you noticed how these men grow in their faith now and their understanding of the Lord? They're just like us. You know, this, somebody, when somebody says to me all of a sudden, well, I got everything God wants me to have. Have you really? <laughs> Do you have any idea what God wants you to have? <laughs> if you lived a million years, you wouldn't have everything God wants you to have. <clears throat> Genesis 24, 1. Abraham was old, well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, I put, I pray thee, I pray thee, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth. Now watch this. Thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, now watch this. Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? I said another way. What if I go over to where you came from in your land, and I find a bride, but she won't come back over here to where you are and Isaac? Do you want me to get Isaac and take him back over there to where you came from? Yeah. That's what he just said. That's what he said. Do you want me to take Isaac back to where he came from? Abraham said, no way. Watch this. And Abraham said unto him, Where thou bringest not my son thither again. Now that's the old way of saying, do not take my son back where he came from. The Lord God of heaven, watch this, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee. And thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. The second time. Do not take my son back to where I came from. Amen. Amen. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, died on the cross, we no longer know him after the flesh. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. Amen. And so what does he do? He sends the Holy Spirit into this world to take a bride for him. And that's who we are. That's, that's who we are to come and take a bride for him. But he will never come into this world again in the flesh. He came one time. He'll never come again. When he comes again, he'll come as the Lord God Almighty, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Coming as a royal king. Coming on seated on a white horse in power and great glory. Only do not take my son back where I came from. Why'd you say that, Abraham? Because I am in the land of promise and I'm going to stay in the land of promise. I'm not going to leave the land of promise. I'm where God put me and I'm going to stay where God put me and I'm not leaving the land of promise. Why, Abraham? Because this is the place of promise. Where I was was not the promise. This is the promise. This is the promise. And I stay in the promise. Amen. He learned something. He learned a great lesson. When he went through the promised land the first time, the Bible said there was famine in the land. He went in there and the Bible said he continued journeying after he'd built an altar at Bethel. He continued to journey and he went on down into Egypt. Yeah. Then he came back up out of Egypt. He came back into the land. It's an amazing thing when you watch Abraham as he comes into the land and he goes back out of the land. But when he finally got back into the land and wound up in the land and he bought that cave of Machpelah, 
and he, from, uh, uh, he bought that as a burying place. He put Sarah's body in that cave. Abraham wasn't going anywhere. He was he's staying in the promised land. Now, I'll ask you this question. Let you all take this with you when you leave out of here tonight. When the Bible said Abraham gave to his son Isaac all that he had, well, what did he have left to give as gifts to these other sons? And what did he have when he gave, what did he give to his son Isaac when he gave him all that he had? Now, he could certainly give him his blessing. You know how Jacob finagled around and got Isaac's blessing. But he certainly could give him his blessing. But what could Abraham, what did Abraham give Isaac when the Bible says he gave him all that he had? And notice, this is right before he dies. Just like when Jacob, in the end of the book of Genesis, when he was leaning upon his staff and blessing the twelve the sons, and uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, the son of Joseph. What did he give him? What did he give him? That's a thought been going through my mind. That's something to take home. Look it up. See what you find. See what you think. It'd be amazing to find out some something in there, wouldn't it? Amen. But he have any idea tonight? Well, he gave him his walk with God. He gave him his testimony, didn't he? I mean, Isaac couldn't have had a better father than Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob certainly gave him that. He gave him his love. He said, now I know you love me. At the top of Moriah, when he offered up his only son, he gave him his love. He said, take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. He gave him the promise that he received from God. He gave him the promise he received from God. I mean, they're in the land. They're there. He's saying to his son, I'm not going to let you go back to where I came from. Right. Birthright. Yeah. Of course, Isaac wasn't the firstborn, but he was the only born. <laughs> as far as God's concerned, he was the only one born. His pedigree. See how stuff like that makes you think? As you trace that genealogy on down, he gave him all that he had. He didn't withhold anything from Isaac. And the reason he didn't because he loved him. He loved him. Isaac is a type of Christ. Does God the Father love God the Son? Of course he does. His only begotten Son. Well, in our lifetime, we can produce a lot of dead works. The Bible said we're created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. But there, you compared good works with dead works. And dead works are product of the flesh. The good work is where the Bible says that uh, it says over there in Philippians to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God that does what? Worketh in you both to do and to will of his good pleasure. It's God working in you. All right. It's God working in you. He that hath begun a good will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. All right. So good works and dead works. I've got plenty of dead works folks. I got a pile of garbage out here. You live long enough, you're going to have it. You're going to, you're, going to, you're going to follow the flesh. You're going to follow your feelings. You're going to follow your intellect. You're going to live as a natural man and, and lean to your own understanding. And all that's going to come. It's going to happen to all of us. So what do you do? Well, you crawl over in a corner somewhere and roll over and die. That's what, isn't that what, isn't that what, what, what did Jonah do? Isn't that what he said? Isn't, isn't that what, what did Elijah say when, after he'd stood before the king? What do you want to do? I just want to die. I just want to die. That's what he said. God doesn't want you to die. No, no, he doesn't want you to die. Somebody preached about the potter the other day. Who was that? Brother McNeese. He said, Jeremiah, come on down to the potter's house. I want to show you something. That's what God wants. That's what he wants. If God be for you, who can be against you? Well, Satan's against me. It doesn't matter if God's for you. Satan cannot match God. Go to the potter's house and watch him as he forms that thing on the wheel. You don't learn that overnight. He said, I am the potter and you're the clay. Israel is in my hands as the clay. So are we in his hands as the clay. He wants to bless you, help you, mold you, make you, form Christ in you. Good night, folks. You think God Almighty's little like us and takes pleasure and 
and some kind of an arrogance, some kind of a selfish motive to see somebody fall and, yeah. and, and destroyed. No. Amen. He raised you up like he raised up Mephibosheth and put you at his table. Amen. That's what he wants to do with you. That's good. Give your life to him tonight. He's your friend. Amen. You have no greater friend than Amen. him. Bless his holy name. <laughs> There's no greater friend. Amen. Satan takes me back to where I came from. I drove by, occasionally, I'm, I'm awful bad about this, but I drove by my old high school a couple of days ago on Vermont Avenue. I looked over at the building. Bricks are falling out of it. Roof's falling in. It's, uh, it's just falling down. The city won't spend any money on it. And so rural high school is just a, it's a derelict sitting there. And boy, the memories flooded through my mind. Memories I'm talking about 50 years ago. This coming June will be 50 years since I graduated from high school. But the memories, some of them are as fresh as they can be. I looked at that and I thought I, I got the feeling. It finally, it finally really begins to settle in. My, how time has passed. How we progress. Have we learned anything? Do I know anymore? A couple of days ago, I saw a woman who's uh, well known. She's a, she's a singer, got a beautiful voice, and she's a multimillionaire. Her singing ability has enriched her beyond measure. You wouldn't believe how rich she is. 70 years old, exposing herself. I thought to myself when I saw her, I thought, here's a 70-year-old woman that's as empty and dead in her soul as she can be. She's dead in her soul, folks. Dead and empty. You see, money cannot buy what you've got tonight. Can't buy it. Can't buy it. Can't buy it. Time's passing. It's quickly passing. It's passing. What are you doing with it? Why don't you give your life to him tonight? Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you bless your word, the time we spent here studying it. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I know what your thoughts are toward us. They're good. I know what your desire is. It's good. You make no mistakes. You never have. You never will. You're incapable of mistake or error. You're almighty God. God, grant me the spiritual vision. God, grant me the faith. Lord, to walk before you. To walk before you. In thy holy name I pray. Amen.